uh, a warm welcome to our uh, mock adjudication that we're undertaking this afternoon. Um, I'm Patrick Waterhouse. Um, before we start today's proceedings, uh, as you can expect, we've got the two preliminaries to deal with. So please turn everything off for this introduction. Um, you're able to submit questions to us uh, in the chat. Uh, you can see the uh, instructions for that then. And if you are required to speak at any point, um, please unmute yourself, obviously, but keep your microphones off mute. Um, we're expecting potentially as many as 130 people uh, with us this afternoon. And if you are all unmuted, it should present some entertaining but probably confusing things for us to listen to. Um, the NEC Users Group Conference is very grateful to the supporters whose names and logos you can see on here on the screen at the moment. They are people who have uh, financially and in other ways supported the event, so please do remember that in your future dealings with them. Okay, moving on to today. Um, there are three of us that will be speaking today. Uh, hopefully it will remain very polite. There will only be one of us speaking at once. Uh, we have uh, two solicitors, one speaking for each of the two parties, and I will be acting as the adjudicator. So the uh, representative for the referring party is Nicholas Gould, and Nicholas is a partner at Fennec Elliott, and it says here that he con conducts a mix of international dispute resolution and non-contentious work. He's a solicitor advocate, a chartered surveyor, although we won't hold that against him, uh, an adjudicator and a mediator, uh, and he acts for contractors, employers and governments in a variety of projects. Uh, some of you may know Nicholas because uh, he's a visiting professor at King's College London, and he's president-elect of the uh, Dispute Re Resolution Board Federation and past chairman of the Society of Construction Law. Uh, and Nicholas will be acting for the referring party this afternoon, which is the contractor. Up against him, uh, acting for the client in this dispute, is Jeremy Glover, also a partner at Fenwick Elliott, and he has specialised in construction, energy and engineering law for most of his career, advising on projects at home and abroad, uh, including dispute avoidance and resolution. Uh, and at the bottom of his biography, somewhat worryingly for me as the adjudicator and also for Nicholas, he has extensive experience in a number of main contract forms, including, but not restricted to, NEC. So two very uh, formidable advocates this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick Waterhouse. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, I spend part of my life teaching people how to use NEC contracts properly, and the other part of my life dealing with disputes when they've ignored the advice they got in the first place. Uh, adjudication uh, in the UK is the main form of dispute resolution. Uh, NEC contracts are no different to the other standard forms that, that we work with, and we certainly see a fair number of, of NEC disputes that end up at adjudication. So today's scenario. Uh, it, hopefully, you've all had some type of uh, PDF or handout sent to you. It involves uh, a real dispute with sufficient details changed to, to hide who was involved and where and when. Um, but it involves coastal defences, where the project manager has instructed uh, a change to the scope, additional works to be constructed. Uh, and it's an NEC4 engineering and construction contract, uh, the one that looks like this. Uh, with main option B, which is a priced contract with a bill of quantities, and amongst other secondary options, X2, the change in law, and X7, delay damages. Uh, and this dispute looks like it's going to have to deal with assessing the change to the prices and any effect on the completion date and the liquidated and ascertained damages. So that's what we're dealing with. We are working on the assumption that the people here have read what's been sent to them. Uh, we're not going to be repeating much more of the detail of uh, the dispute before we start. So just as uh, an introduction to a mock adjudication, normally adjudication is 
people talk about a 28 days procedure. Well, when you add in the, the nomination, the appointment of the adjudicator uh, and so on, it usually takes a little longer. But we've got 90 minutes today, so please forgive us if uh, our attempt at simplifying it sufficiently to get it through in 90 minutes uh, has potentially led to some of the detail being removed. The issues we're dealing with here are very real. Uh, these are things that crop up time and time again in the disputes that uh, Nicholas, Jeremy and I deal with. Uh, and therefore, some of it to those of you who have not yet dealt with an adjudication may seem a bit strange, but these things do happen and they happen regularly. The rules of natural justice in any legal tribunal have to be complied with. And in adjudication, as with any others, if we end up with a decision by the adjudicator that's not enforceable, it's of no use to the parties and it's probably of no use to the adjudicator who would suffer financial damage from potentially not getting paid and reputational damage when the judge was unkind enough to name him or her in the court proceedings. So that's the background to what we're looking at today. So where have we got to so far? You've seen in your handout that we've got a notice of adjudication issued by the contractor. The parties have decided not to refer this dispute to the senior representatives. Uh, in the UK, uh, where we have the Housing Grants Act and equivalent in Northern Ireland, the parties in a construction contract have the right to go to adjudication at any time, so the senior representatives can be bypassed. The adjudicator, I've been nominated by the ICE's Dispute Resolution Service. I've accepted that nomination and sent my terms uh, and my initial directions to the parties. As is very common, the referring parties come straight back to me and returned a copy of my terms and said, yes, we agree entirely. Thank you very much. And the first typo of the uh, uh, presentation you can see there, uh, I've called it the employer. It's actually the client in NEC4. I apologize. But the client has not replied at all to my initial email and directions, and that is entirely common. The referrals then been issued by the contractor and a response by the client. And you can see just in a few um, in a few simple slide, a few simple bullet points in your handout, what the uh, the elements were in those various um, uh, submissions. So, the first issue is: Have I, the adjudicator, been validly appointed? This is an important point because if I haven't, I have no jurisdiction, and therefore my uh, decision would be a nullity; it would not be enforceable. You'll see that someone drafting the contract has said that the adjudicator nominating body is the Royal Institution of Civil Surveyors. And most of you here, I suspect, will know that there probably isn't a body of that precise name. The contractor has argued that the appointment by the ICE is valid, uh, but the client argues that it's invalid because it's clear to anyone that it should really have been the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. So I'm now going to hand over for issue number one to the referring party uh, so that uh, Nicholas can explain his party's position. Thank you very much, um, Patrick. So dropping into uh, mock adjudication mode, um, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, of course, to see that we have a, a challenge by the, the client um, in relation to this issue uh, and, and you should dismiss it straight away. So the general rule, of course, is that a party should refer any dispute uh, under the NEC contract to the adjudicator named in the contract or ask the ANB, the adjudicator nominating body in the contract, to choose an adjudicator. So um, here um, we were faced with the situation where the contract data states the Royal Institution of Civil Surveyors should be the ANB and they, they simply do not exist. Um, you may say it's a confusion between the, the RICS or, or the ICE potentially, um, but uh, that doesn't really matter um, because what the uh, contractor correctly did was realise that that uh, party, that uh, institution didn't exist and therefore the situation um, is that you go to any other ANB and ask them to make an appointment. So. Um, uh, uh, my support for this position is, is the Murphy case, Murphy and Mayer, uh, not that long ago, really, if you think about it, 2016, given that adjudication has been with us now for, for over 20 years. It just goes to show how long it takes to iron out some of the issues. So in that case, um, there was an NEC3 contract, identical 
for today's purposes to the NEC4 used in this case. Now, in the Murphy case, the contract data named the TCC as the ANB. Now, actually, the TCC is the Technology and Construction Court, and you could say they correctly identified a body uh, there, but um, the TCC does not make appointments. So the referring party went to the RICS, uh, and of course, um, uh, after the adjudicator accepted uh, jurisdiction and gave an award, it, the enforcement was challenged. And Sir Robert Aikenhead in that case um, said that in the absence of an ad hoc agreement or, or, or the identification of an individual, any responsible institution could make an appointment. And in that case, the RICS was fine. He did specifically say that the ICE, the RIBA, Tech Bar and Texa would be all equally responsible. And, and the important point was that, that he noted that the TCC, whilst existing, didn't operate as an A and B. So I don't think it matters in this case whether the Royal Institution of Civil Engineers, uh, Civil Surveyors is, is, is almost the RICS or almost the ICE. It's, it's not uh, a body that exists uh, uh, and um, therefore um, you've been validly appointed if we follow Murphy. Uh, and you do not need to resign. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now hand over to uh, Mr. Glover on behalf of the client for, for his position on this. Um, thank you very much, sir. I mean, the position here is um, very simple. Um, both parties intended to use the RICS as the appointing body. That's what the contract said. It was obvious that that was what was intended. If the parties had wanted to choose the ICE, then you would see the initials ICE in the contract. The parties would have said so. The contractor has simply ignored what was agreed in the contract. That's not acting in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Therefore, regretfully, sir, I have to say that you've been invalidly appointed. appointed. The question of your jurisdiction is absolutely fundamental. The contractor agreed to use the RICS as the appointing body and then didn't do so. I mean, as I say, the contractor's actions show a certain disregard for what was agreed um, between us. And that in itself is enough to deal with this issue. But the courts have actually supported my position and the Johnson and Mayher case, which um, my friend Mr Gould referred to, actually supports the position too. That dealt with the TCC that contract in that case named the TCC. And the judge said, as Mr Gould has said, the TCC is not an ANB. It doesn't appoint adjudicators. Here, the contract named the RICS, and the RICS is an ANB. It does appoint adjudicators. And I'd also refer to the AMEC and Whitefriars case. And that's a good example of when the courts will allow a party to use an alternative AMB. In AMEC, the named adjudicator had sadly died and the agreed appointment process could not be followed. Here, the process could be followed because the parties had named the RICS. And Mr Gould said that his case from 2011, well, it's, you know, it's old established law. But if you go back further to pre-adjudication cases, the law was already well established in situations like this. Lord Denning, in the um, Nitan and Steel case, said the court very used to dealing with misnomers when there's a situation like this, where one word is slightly different. And the courts don't allow people to take advantage of misnomers when everybody knows what was intended. And that's what the position was here. Everybody knows what was intended. And Lord Denning said the test was this. How would a reasonable person receiving the document take it? In all the circumstances of the case, and looking at the document as a whole, the reasonable man would say to himself, of course, it must mean me, but they've got my name wrong. Then it's a case of mere, mere, mere misnomer. Sir, I think the question for you is, what did the initials RICS mean to you? There can only be one answer. Thank you. So thank you very much to, uh, to both uh, uh, representatives. It's clearly a, a challenging question because on one hand I, I acknowledge the uh, the initials are RICS but uh, there is no such body as the Royal Institution of Civil Surveyors. The phrase also includes the, ter the three words institution of civil so you could see why that possibly might be engineers um, and I don't agree having carefully considered both parties positions 
Um, I don't agree that it's necessarily that clear that it meant either one or the other. Um, I think in terms of the uh, the two cases quoted in terms of Murphy and Mayer and Amec and Whitefriars, they both have a certain relevance to this point. But I think the, the Murphy and Mayer one uh, was an NEC3 dispute. And the words of, um, I'm not sure if he was Sir Robert Aikenhead or Mr Aikenhead in those days, were clear that a commercially sensible approach should be taken. Uh, both the RICS and the ICE hold themselves out as bodies that appoint or sorry, nominate uh, adjudicators. And therefore, I think in the absence of a, of a clear statement of a body that does exist, uh, going to either of those bodies would have been acceptable. So I've made a non-binding decision that I have been properly appointed. I'm not going to resign. Now, as an explanation to those of you who wonder what a non-binding decision is, the adjudicator here is not given uh, jurisdiction in option W2 of the um, NEC documents to decide his or her own jurisdiction. So my decision is that I think I have been properly appointed and I'm going to carry on, but there is the there, there's the risk to me and to the parties that at enforcement proceedings, if there are any, the judge might take the contrary view and might say, well, actually, we don't think this adjudicator was properly appointed and therefore his or her decision is a nullity. And that's the risk that the two parties and the adjudicator take. And that's why the arguments that you've just heard do have to be carefully considered. The, the adjudicator can't just merely say, I'm carrying on with this stuff you nor in terms of people getting access to justice through adjudication, can the adjudicator resign at the first sign of any difficulty and say, oh, this sounds a bit difficult. So that's the first issue that I've uh, decided that I'm going to carry on. Uh, jurisdiction challenges are one of the biggest issues that adjudicators often have to deal with, particularly at the front end of adjudications and the courts and the various nominating bodies have always been very clear that adjudicators have to get to grips with jurisdiction issues they can't dodge them so we'll now move on to what's becoming a very common scenario issue two is access to the project management systems with much of our business going online with much of our business hopefully being collaborative we are seeing more and more projects run on IT systems that are common to all of the participants. And frequently we see the systems in question uh, being provided by one of the parties in the uh, agreements. It's not necessarily always the contractor or always the client. And sometimes we see it's sometimes say the project, the company that provides the project manager. Uh, and as soon as this dispute started, the contractor revoked the client's access to this system, which clearly will then hamper uh, the client's ability to answer the, uh, the issues that have been put to it and to deal with this. And so the client obviously wants access uh, to the system. So I'll now hand over to Mr Gould uh, and he can explain uh, why he thinks uh, that this access does not need to be provided. Uh, thank you, sir. So um, the, the simple position is that access to Seymour was never within uh, the notice of adjudication. And this is something that the client has sought afterwards. And if they want to take up a separate adjudication for it, then that's a matter for them. This dispute uh, is all about uh, a, a change and the costs relating to that change. And you have the documents already uh, that both parties have produced in relation to the valuation of that item. Um, uh, so it's just not within your jurisdiction to do it um, uh, and an adjudicator can't decide to give the client access. So what I mean by that is that um, whilst you might request under the rules and the rules do allow you in uh, in W2.2, uh, um, sorry, point, uh, point 0.4 clause 4 um, to request certain documents, it doesn't go as far as, as getting access to an entire computerized system. And um, the only analogy I can find um, for you in relation to this was a case involving Trant and Mott McDonald a few years ago about a, a BIM system um, where the courts did in fact grant access uh, to a party uh, to the other's um, system. Um, but this was done on the basis of giving an injunction and only on the basis that all of the money in dispute was placed into court. So you can see that the giving of an injunction is not something that's within your powers. Um, neither is it possible for you to take money into an escrow account uh, in, in that way. So I, I simply say that 
um, that the uh, contractual powers that you have under W2 do not go that far. And if you were to have a look at them, I'm sure my, my learned friend will take you to them, um, you will see that um, uh, it says that uh, you might, you might instruct uh, a party to provide further information in relation to the issues in dispute. So wholesale access to a computer system uh, is more of a fishing expedition uh, and, and uh, you should reject it. Thank you. Right, uh, Mr. Glover, over to you. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much. I mean, I think it's clear, to be honest, sir, from um, Mr. Gould's submissions that not only can you decide whether or not to give access to the system, you must give both my client and yourself um, access to the system. I mean, you can, as a judicator, take initiative in ascertaining the facts relating to the dispute. You can instruct a party to take any action considered necessary for you to reach your decision. If you have a look at clause, I think that's in clause uh, W2.34, taking the initiative and ascertaining the facts to reach your decision. I mean, alternatively, and then a party doesn't comply, then you actually take that into account when proceeding to make your decision, and that's there in Rule W 2.3.5, and I'm sure you've you've been reading that um, in preparation for this hearing. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's actually really simple. The contractor wants my client to take part in this adjudication with one arm tied behind my back, if not two arms. So no coincidence this happened at the same time as the adjudication started. Of course it's not an issue in the notice of adjudication because it's something the contractor conveniently did at the time it started the adjudication. Without access to the Seymour system, my client cannot access all the project documentation. That is not fair. My client has been prevented from contesting this dispute on a level playing field. Unless you allow us to access the same project information that we're entitled to under the contract, the same information that the contractor already has, you're prejudicing our ability to take part in this adjudication. And you, we know what the answer is at law because the Mr. Gould on behalf of the contractor has already told us about the, tra the trans case. The employer went to court and got an injunction forcing the contractor to allow it to have access to the documentation system. So you know what the law is. You know that if we go to court, we will win. And although the TCC is one of the quickest, most efficient courts there is, going to the court to get an adjudication takes time. And by the time we get an adjudication, a, a decision on the injunction, it's quite likely that this adjudication will be over. So I think it's quite clear the rule of law the rules of natural justice and the rules of the contract say that you should exercise your powers under the contract to give us and yourself access to the Seymour system. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both parties there. And for those of you watching and listening, you've you've heard the, the arguments involved in this situation. It is quite common now as a, as a tactic. Um, and as I said at the, at the start, it's not always the contractor that provides these systems. It's sometimes the client, sometimes other consultants involved. And uh, as Mr. Glover's just said, it does completely hamper one party's ability uh, to undertake an adjudication. And in the event that this problem was allowed to uh, to be successful for those doing it, it would mean that every participant in a collaborative project would be wanting to upload documents to the shared system and to its own just in case on an ongoing basis uh, they ever needed it. So my view is that I, I agree with Mr Glover and I'm instructing the contractor to provide access to the system to me and to the client. And I'm relying on that in uh, two of the bullets in W2.34. The one that allows me to take the uh, initiative in ascertaining the facts and the law. Well, by getting access to that system, I'm certainly ascertaining the facts and also allowing me to instruct a party to take any other action which is considered necessary to reach a decision and to do so within a stated time. Um, 
you've got to also bear in mind that all communications in an adjudication are copied to the other two people at the same time. So anything from either party gets sent to me and copied to the other party. And when I issue something to one of the parties, it's copied to the, the second party. And therefore, anything that I instruct the parties to provide will automatically be provided to the other party. So that was uh, my decision. I think that uh, Mr Gould's argument about this, uh, this happening after the notice is irrelevant, and I suspect it's a red herring where he's trying to mislead me. Uh, it is irrelevant because access to the system was only blocked after the notice of adjudication was issued. So we'll move on to the third issue and quite a topical one at the moment um, that the delayed damages are penal and should not be awarded. You will see that £100,000 of delayed damages have been deducted from the contractor and the contractor wants that money back, put bluntly. Uh, for those of you relatively new to NEC contracts, we tend not to use the phrase liquidated damages or liquidated and ascertained damages because there are two types of liquidated damages in this contract. There's delay damages which are for delay and there are low performance damages for low performance in, in largely in output specification projects. But nonetheless, uh, the law of liquidated damages uh, Chain, well, some might say changed, some might say evolved with two key cases in 2015 that I think at least one of our advocates is going to talk us through in a few minutes. And those of you watching some of the uh, the more prolific people with news feeds this week will have seen a case that came in from New Zealand where the courts in New Zealand seem to be following what uh, the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom had been doing. So we will hand over now uh, to Mr Gould to tell us what he thinks about the delay damages here. Thank you very much, sir. So um, uh, I think it's quite uh, clear that in this case uh, it is void as a penalty. Now, uh, this used to be something we heard years and years ago, um, fairly repeatedly, and, and it got short thrift frequently from the from the courts and, and, and therefore from arbitrators as it was and, and, and also moving into adjudication. And sometimes um, it was quite difficult to, to challenge these these uh, rates. Now, um, fortunately, where well, there has been some clarification in the past few years, uh, which, which means that we're on a much more fair um, and objective playing field. Um, now, first of all, then I'd just like to, to, to point out to you that um, the secondary obligation here, X7 delay damages, does apply. Uh, and if you read that clause, it, it refers to uh, a daily rate. And interestingly, in, in the contract data, we seem to have a weekly rate. Now, um, first of all, I say then that um, you read these clauses very strictly uh, and it doesn't work from a simple mechanics perspective. Uh, um, uh, uh, daily rate does not translate into a weekly rate and greater care should have been taken in relation to how that was placed into the contract data. Um, but that's not really the main point. The main point that is if you um, look at this recent case, this 2015 case from the Supreme Court, so the, uh, the highest court uh, governing this jurisdiction, um, this is the Cavendish case uh, and Parkai. Um, then um, what you take from that case at paragraph 32 of the judgment is that the true test is whether the um, provision is a secondary obligation which imposes a detriment to the contract breaker, so my client in this case, the contractor, which is out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party. Uh, in the enforcement of this uh, primary obligation. So we're talking about sea defences here, uh, and um, the uh, client has not provided any explanation, calculation, or any substantiation of any delay damages whatsoever. You know, this isn't like opening a, a superstore or, or completing a house where the occupants might be renting somewhere. Uh, this is, uh, there is no damage at all, uh, and therefore a substantial amount of £25,000 per week uh, is... Uh, in relation to this Supreme Court case, certainly um, out of all proportion to any legitimate interest. And so um, on that basis, we say that it is quite clearly applying the Supreme Court case, um, a penalty, uh, and um, you, should, uh, you can simply decide that that money should be repaid on that basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Gould. Uh, Mr Glover. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I note that the um, contractor has introduced yet more new arguments to this case, um, suggesting that 
the uh, rate of LADs actually is, is, shouldn't be allowed because it actually should be a, a daily rate. Well, I don't think that really goes anywhere. And in a, any event, I believe you said that Mr. Gould used to be a charter surveyor, so I'm sure he can use a calculator to, to work out the correct figure. Um, but more importantly, um, the contractor agreed that the LAD figure of £25,000 a week was proportionate because it agreed that sum in the contract. It shouldn't have agreed that figure if it thought otherwise. It can't many weeks, many months after the event turn around and say, well, actually, that sum isn't fair. It's penal. Um, therefore, it shouldn't be allowed. The contractor had the chance when the contract was being put together to make these arguments. And in the McDessy case, which um, Mr Gould has referred to, in that case, the court noted that a clause negotiated by legal advisers Mr Gould, is likely to be fair and is going to be agreed and upheld, more importantly, upheld by the courts. And that's really the crux of this particular issue. And Mr Gould has said that um, the client, my, my, my client, the, the council, hasn't um, adduced um, any evidence. Well, actually, it's for his client, the contractor, to adduce the evidence um, in this particular instance. It's his client who's, his client who's saying that this clause is unfair, but the contractor hasn't adduced any evidence to suggest that it considers or that the sum is not legitimate. And that I submit is simply because it cannot. The onus is on the contractor to demonstrate that the clause is unfair. It hasn't even begun to try to do so. And that I think deals with this matter very simply and straightforwardly, sir. Right, uh, thank you very much uh, to both representatives. Now, in a in a situation where we have a disagreement uh, that the, the terms of the contract, as, as Mr Gould has said, in option X7 says that uh, it's paid at the rate stated in the contract data, um, but Mr Gould says that that should be a daily rate. Why is that, Mr Gould? Sorry, I, I don't say that it should be a daily rate. I say that it should be um, a penalty. Um, but if it were anything, it would be a weekly rate because that's what's written in the contract data when you look at the, the place where you insert the figure. But if you go back to X7, the wording of that is based on a daily rate. So there's certainly some confusion in the drafting there. OK, thank you. And for those of you watching and listening, please do take away from this the importance of getting your contract data right. It's the same with JCT, with contract particulars and any other form of contract. The minutiae that typically people, you know, glare at you when you raise it, when you're putting contract documents together, suddenly becomes really important at times like this, uh, as you've just seen. So having considered both parties' uh, situation and arguments, I've concluded I agree with Mr Glover that the contractor, the one bringing this argument, has not shown that the delay damages are a penalty. Uh, and therefore, I have concluded that they are deductible at the rate agreed in the contract. And if you look at what was said by the judges in the uh, two cases in the Supreme Court, uh, there's no there's no uh, explanation from the contractor as to why the amount stated isn't in the uh, connected with the legitimate business interests of the client here. And there was an argument in the uh, in the referral about the cause of the delay here, I don't think that's relevant to this point as to whether the damages are a penalty or not. So if we move on to our fourth uh, issue, and now quite a common one, uh, once we've decided that the adjudicator does or does not have what we call threshold uh, a jurisdiction to decide a dispute, we then look at matters of internal jurisdiction. And has the adjudicator here actually got the jurisdiction to deal with any change to the completion date uh, that's been alleged in the referral. So in the referral, the contractor has said it wants a change to the completion date, an additional four weeks. And the client has said that I've no jurisdiction to assess that as the change to the completion date was not in the notice of adjudication. And I think Mr Glover will explain the importance of that. And the contractor in the reply that came after the response uh, has said that the contractor is entitled to seek a change to the completion date as it's an integral part of assessing any compensation event. So I'll now hand you over uh, to Mr Gould to explain his party's position. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Yes, so um, the notice of adjudication is, as we said earlier, the basis for the adjudicator's jurisdiction. We don't change the position at all there. And in that notice, the contractor simply asked for, uh, and, and to quote, a return of £100,000 to lay damages, unquote. You, there is no mention of completion date there. But the completion date is a part of the matters in dispute. And in order to determine whether the 100,000 is repayable, it's necessary uh, 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 and you can't avoid an assessment of the completion date. It's a simple logical progression um, that uh, as you move the completion date, uh, so the delay damages may also change. So the only way to assess a return of the delay damages, which is within your jurisdiction, is to assess that completion date. So um, Cantillon and Uvasco is the case that uh, helps us there, because uh, in that case, Cantillon sought to enforce an adjudicator's decision um, in which the adjudicator had decided that, that Cantillon received a nine, nine weeks worth of prolongation. They'd sought 13 weeks, uh, but only received nine. Now, Uvasco opposed enforcement on the basis that the adjudicator had no jurisdiction because the claim was for 13 weeks and the adjudicator couldn't determine some other some other period. The Technology Court on Enforcement rejected that approach. They said it's an integral part. Um, fixing the date was an integral part of working out how much should be paid. So simply, sir, I say to you that if you apply <coughs> Cantor to this um, exactly same position, um, you're permitted to determine the change to the completion date in order to come to a conclusion about what that date should be, to then reach a firm decision on repayment of the delay damages. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mr. Gould. Um, and now I'll hand you over to Mr. Glover, who may have a different point of view. Yes. Jeremy, your microphone is on mute. I can't get it off. Okay. You're right, that's it, you're off, best start. Okay, again. right, here we go. Right, I po apologies for that, sir. Um, as I was saying, but you couldn't hear me, um, the notice of adjudication is the key document in any adjudication. And I say that because it sets out the jurisdiction of the adjudicator and it sets out the issues you must decide. Um, no lesser authority than Lord Justice Coulson himself, who's written perhaps the key um, adjudication textbook, which is now in its fourth edition, I believe, has described the notice as the cornerstone of the part of the adjudicator's jurisdiction and also the scope and limit of the referring party's claim in that adjudication. Here, the notice of adjudication didn't seek any change to the completion date. It sought something different, return of the delay damages. Now, adjudication is a quick fire form of dispute resolution. And it's important that you, sir, the adjudicator, and the parties know what is part of the dispute. And really what's happening here and what can't be allowed is that referring parties seeking to change its mind over what has and what has not been referred to adjudication. And Mr. Gould has explained or said that he's allowed to do this because of the Cantillon um, case. Now, the difference between the Cantillon case and the case here is that the reason the adjudicator was permitted to take into account other issues when considering prolongation was because of what had been raised in the defences. Because of what was in the defences, that brought a wider jurisdiction to the adjudication. It wasn't the case of the um, referring party being able to change its mind about what had been brought to the adjudication. Um, and that's sort of what's happened here, sir, because it's not actually necessary for you to determine the change to the completion date. The contractor asked for the return of the 100K because it said that the LADs were a penalty. Now, you've already decided that they're not a penalty. And that's a so wholly separate issue to considering whether or not the contractor is entitled to an extension of time. So I really think you've dealt with the issue and you cannot allow the referring party to extend the issues in dispute in this adjudication. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. So th thank you very much. Um, as part of the commentary of today, it, it is a regular feature of adjudication that 
the notice of adjudication and the referral differ in some way. Sometimes that's trivial, sometimes it's material, and sometimes it can be fatal to the dispute. And that is what the uh, adjudicator is being asked to deal with here. Uh, whether it was the intention of the contractor to do this or it was just um, poor drafting of the documents, uh, we will never know. And the adjudicator has to deal with, with what was put in front of him rather than what one of the parties now wished they'd put in front of him. And this is a, uh, this is a problem that, that has been faced a number of times because having decided that the delayed damages are enforceable, in order to decide whether they are returned or not, involves an assessment on when the revised completion date was uh, compared to when completion was achieved and therefore did the con contractor finish in delay or on time or early. So the adjudicator says that a change to the completion date was not asked in a notice and therefore is outside the jurisdiction. However, the notice, and I think it was Mr Glover who said it, it sets the uh, uh, it, he quoted uh, Mr Coulson saying how important the notice is for setting the parameters of the dispute. The notice does ask me to consider the return of the delay damages and it's a necessary part of that analysis that I need to consider the date from which they should have been deducted if any of those damages are due. And so therefore I am going to consider the completion date. Um, a typo there, I do apologise, as part of the issue concerning the return of the delay damages. on to the issue of party costs. So in uh, adjudication, uh, you have to pay the adjudicator at the end of the process. Well, in most situations you do. And of course, we, we're just providing a service to the community. So we'd like to be paid on time, please. Uh, but equally, uh, Mr. Glover and Mr. Gould require paying for. And depending on the size of your dispute, uh, the party costs can be significant. Um, most parties, I think, are usually sensible enough to try and keep their costs in proportion with the amount that's in dispute. Uh, and on occasions, on bigger adjudications, the cost will run into seven figures. Now, that's not very common, but it does happen. Uh, and in disputes like this one, which involve several hundred thousand pounds, it would not be unusual to see costs of anywhere between, I don't know, 25 to £50,000 per party, depending on how technical the dispute was and how much further advice they needed to obtain opinion on. So this can be a difficult issue. And for parties who feel they are entirely innocent in their dispute, they do feel slightly miffed when they uh, end up paying their own bills. So that's the background to, the, to this issue. The notice of adjudication has asked me to effectively get one party to pay the other party's costs. But the client has argued that I've no jurisdiction to do that. So I'll hand over now to Mr Gould, who will explain on behalf of the contractor what they think. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, I should start out by saying that um, uh, often um, uh, parties might like to receive their costs and, and, and sometimes they can't for various reasons. Uh, and this is not one of those situations. Um, and what I mean by that is that the notice of adjudication sought costs uh, right at the outset, and therefore it is within your jurisdiction. We've already had this discussion, and I think uh, both parties and you accept that uh, if it's in that notice of adjud adjudication, it is in within your jurisdiction. So the notice requested costs. Um, and the costs are sought as damages in this case. So they're direct damages uh, arising from the client or the project manager's breach. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that um, additional members were requested. Uh, uh, a quotation was provided that was very detailed. It, it's a compensation event. They should be compensated. Uh, and no proper assessment has been done. Simply a hatchet job to the figures and then four weeks uh, uh, of delay damages. No calculation at all. Um, now, um, uh, what I would say is that if, if there'd been some careful calculations and the contractual machinery was playing out in the usual way, um, then it may well be the case um, that costs wouldn't be a direct uh, loss here because an adjudication probably could have been avoided or might have been avoidable um, by uh, the figures being shown to my, my client. But in this case, it was just um, clearly going to go to an adjudication um, and therefore the costs 
couldn't be avoided. And so they're sought um, as a, a, a direct damages in this instance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Now, Mr. Glover. Um, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I don't agree um, with Mr. Gould. He, his comment that if something is in the adjudication notice, then it is within the jurisdiction of the adjudication is right only insofar as it goes. There are certain things which you're not allowed to claim in an adjudication and party costs is one of them. There's no jurisdiction for an adjudicator to award costs. Parties are only able to agree who pays the legal costs in writing after the service of the adjudication notice. The Housing Grants Act is quite clear about this. If you look at section 108A of the um, Construction Act, and that constrains the party's abilities to recover their costs unless there's an agreement made in writing after the adjudication has commenced. And Mr Gould very ingeniously has tried to get round this by describing his client's costs as damages. Well, it's a ruse. It's absolutely clear what he's trying to do. He's trying to get round and subvert the adjudication legislation and that's very disappointing um, but it's just also you're just not allowed to do it and if you want case law for it i know there's not case on my slide there's a case called enviroflow v redhill where the courts made it absolutely clear that parties wishing to recover adjudication costs can only do so where there is agreement in writing between them that's not the case here and you do not have a jurisdiction to award costs as claimed at all OK, thank you to both of you. Um, I've just had a question in from Mohammed saying, at what stage are the costs decided? On the rare occasion that the two parties do agree to allow the adjudicator jurisdiction to decide costs, uh, we allow time at the end of the procedure for each party to submit details of its costs to the adjudicator and to each other, and then to comment on one another's uh, cost submissions before the adjudicator then includes a decision on party costs in the decision. Now, my decision here is that I do not have jurisdiction to assess and award party costs. Uh, it's not in adjudication procedure W2. Um, and the, the reference from the uh, Construction Act that Mr Glover gave states very clearly that any agreement between the parties as to allowing the adjudicator to assess party costs must be entered into in writing and after the notice of adjudication has been issued. It's a fairly clumsily drafted uh, piece of legislation. I'm saying this now as my role as commentator here rather than adjudicator. Uh, go away and read it. Um, the adjudication fraternity at the time the act was being drafted pointed this out to uh, parliament but they weren't too interested in budging um there's a much older case uh involving i'm forgetting the other party but this this was known as a tolent clause originally because tolent construction was one of the parties to the case where it was decided have either of my learned friends remember the other party in that case yeah richwater that's right, Mr. Gould's just tapped in his machine now, I think. <laughs> uh, which, where a party had written in its standard terms of business that whenever you take us to adjudication, you're paying all of our costs, which is a clear disincentive to do so. And that's why this provision was put into the Construction Act uh, in 2009. So I do not have the ability to assess and award party costs, so I will not be doing so. That is my decision. So, item uh, issue six, correspondence that's labelled without prejudice. Now, in, in business generally, you get a lot of people sticking labels like without prejudice on emails, on letters, on various documents or subject to contract uh, when they often don't understand the implication or the effect of what they're doing. And in dispute resolution, the term without prejudice uh, is quite an important one and I think I'll, I'll leave it to the two uh, representatives to explain that the principles of without prejudice documents but what's been said here is that documents with this label on have been provided to me 
uh, that indicate uh, what was happening in the project manager's mind before, and I quote, she was nobbled by the client. And we've had a question in from somebody saying, does the project manager work for the, um, for the client? Uh, sometimes the project manager does, but not necessarily. Project managers often come in from outside firms. Um, but the project managers uh, is required under the contract to act as stated in the contract and required under under law to act impartially and fairly between the parties and there's therefore a suggestion here that the without prejudice correspondence that she wrote at the time indicated what she truly thought was the right assessment for these compensation events but she changed her mind once she had some pressure brought to bear on her by the client the client says they should not have been disclosed to me and that I should resign as a consequence. Uh, presumably, the argument there is that having read documents that should not be part of the bundles in this dispute, I, my mind has been led in a particular direction it should not have been. So with that introduction, I'll hand you over to Mr Gould, who will no doubt explain more. Thank you, sir. Yes, and of course, we wouldn't want you to be led at all by, by documents that, that um, the other parties should suggest um, uh, where the project manager suggests that the value could be in excess of 200,000 for a 210,000 valuation or more and that would be quite wrong. Um, so turning then to this particular point, um, uh, the, the marking of without prejudice does not bring them within to that specific rule. So when you mark something without prejudice meaningfully what you're saying is we want to negotiate, we want to negotiate a problem we've already got uh, in order to determine and try to settle. It's a settlement process. Um, uh, and in this instance, that's not what this is at all. Um, uh, and um, more importantly, um, these documents, you know, they don't show a genuine attempt to settle a dispute that's already arisen. The dispute comes later on. What these documents really show is the project manager's view before the claim. Um, and before the client got involved and decided that they didn't like the figures. So clearly you can look at these documents. They're not truly without prejudice. Now, in order to, to help you a bit more uh, and support my submission more, I'd like to take you to this case of Transform Schools and Balfour Beatty. It's a recent case of 2020. This problem has been around for a long time. and There are other older cases that touch on this, but this case really uh, takes uh, takes us to the, to the heart of the issue and answers this quite clearly. Um, if you were to have a look at the case later, look at paragraph 32, uh, and that's the one I'm going to focus on because the judge there says that, um, in their opinion, the adjudicator was entitled to consider whether the, the letters marked without prejudice in this case were admissible, um, and he was entitled to look at the submissions made in that regard to understand them, as indeed would be a court. So a court would be entitled to look at documents marked without prejudice and documents in order to decide whether they are admissible or not. So the first thing is, on the basis of this case, you can look at them to decide whether they're admissible or not. And I say that you should look at them and that they are admissible um, because it's about value before uh, settlement discussions even uh, uh, arise. And there are no settlement discussions actually here. It's, we've gone straight to adjudication. And then the other thing that I know you might be worried about is your... Um, a jurisdiction because of course you can have jurisdiction and lose it by breaching natural justice or or doing something you shouldn't have done and and actually this case helpfully goes on to deal with that because it says um that um there's no reason why you shouldn't look at these documents to make a decision uh, and even if you decided to exclude documents you still wouldn't be in breach um because you have the power to decide whether the documents are right to be admitted or not and whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter because it would be an error of law um, and you have jurisdiction to make an error of law. So you can look at these without worrying and decide either way. That's the first thing. And secondly, I say that when you do look at them, um, you should decide that they are informative about the project manager's view of value. And, it's, and, and there is no attempt there for settlement because a dispute hasn't arisen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gould. Uh, I now hand you over to, to Mr. Glover. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I very much fear that if you have considered these without prejudice documents, then you're going to be left with no alternative but to resign, unfortunately. Um, the whole purpose of without prejudice documents 
is that parties can be free to enter into negotiations knowing that those negotiations won't be referred to by a court or by an arbitrator or here um, by an adjudicator. Um, the documents contain genuine attempts to try and agree or discuss the amount of the compensation event. Um, if you take the alternative view, effectively, you're saying that a project manager shouldn't enter into discussions with a contractor. It should just go ahead and make an assessment, because otherwise the project manager is going to be worried that it's attempts to agree a figure with the contractor or with the um, client are going to be looked at. And that's not really how without prejudice should actually work. Um, and here, Mr Gould has relied on the transform case. And yes, it is a case where the court said that in this particular instance, the adjudicator could look at the documents which were marked without prejudice. But what you need to do, sir, is look at why the documents were marked without prejudice. They weren't documents where the parties were trying to enter into a commercial settlement about valuation, about figures. No, they, no, they weren't. I mean, here, um, the adjudicator decided that the words without prejudice are being used to, used by Balfour Beatty, I think it was, to, conf to convey that by offering to carry out certain works that were being proposed, they were not admitting any liability that it was their fault that they were responsible for carrying out the works and also the correspondence was actually relevant to an issue about whether one of the parties was time barred it's very very different here to the situation here well it's all about a commercial negotiation about the value of the compensation event that falls squarely within the traditional without prejudice rule. And that's confirmed by the Ellis and Goldstein case. Two parties entered into commercial negotiations. One of the parties wants to bring some of the without prejudice documentation into, into the um, adjudication. Now, Mr. Justice Aikenhead was the judge here. And he said that the court, this is the TCC, strongly discouraged parties from deploying without prejudice communications in adjudications. And that's what's happened here. And if you look at paragraph 20, 29, you'll see that Mr. Justice Aikenhead says, such material should not be put before an adjudicator. He goes on, and you might want to bear this in mind, Mr. Gould, to say that lawyers who do so may face professional disciplinary action. And Mr. Justice Aikenhead concludes in paragraph 29, that where an adjudicator decides a case primarily on the basis of wrongly received without prejudice material, that decision may not be enforced. So Mr Justice Aikenhead is clear that without prejudice material, when it's all about trying to achieve a commercial agreement about figures, figures or valuations, try and settle a dispute, to try and avoid the very situation we're in here, to avoid the adjudication, then you should not be referring to those documents at all. Thank you. Well, there you go. Two very different opinions. One person says, well, don't worry about it. Crack on. And the other one saying I should resign. And suddenly we have no adjudicator and we all have to start again. So this is an important area uh, in law generally, not just in adjudication. Um, as both uh, advocates have mentioned, uh, without prejudice, uh, documents are sometimes withheld from tribunals, be that an adjudicator or a judge or an arbitrator, where the documents that are thus labelled have been a genuine attempt to settle a dispute prior to the tribunal and thereby increasing the chances of an amicable settlement and not having a tribunal. The mere labelling without prejudice of itself does not make something uh, untouchable in proceedings. Um, so I've started off on that point, but the correspondence that's been submitted to me does not appear to relate to any attempt to resolve a dispute. It's normal what I've called commercial correspondence. It's between the project manager and the contractor. Uh, it's the type of communication that the contract entirely envisages will happen between the parties. Uh, and the allegation that somebody has been nobbled, in other words, she has been lent upon by somebody to act in a certain way, has not been evidenced. And so it's not something I'm going to deal with any further. Uh, overall, I prefer Mr. Gould's argument on the without prejudice documents. I don't think uh, that the documents are uh, suitable to be withheld from me anyway. Oops, sorry, someone's just clicked something. Uh, 
and that therefore I will consider those documents and I will not be resigning. Uh, for those of you, I'm now moving into commentator mode. Uh, if uh, the uh, the party objecting to me reading these documents uh, is likely to face any type of enforcement proceedings, it is the type of subject they may bring up at the TCC later as part of an attempt to say that the decision uh, was not enforceable, uh, as this might be one of the heads of that argument. Now we move on to uh, issue seven, the assessment of compensation events at a lower value than the project manager previously assessed. Uh, it's quite common in disputes that we end up with three numbers that are being talked about. The contractor wants X pounds, the project managers previously certified Y pounds, and the client, once it comes to dispute resolution, says actually it's Z pounds and the number Z will be significantly lower than the other two numbers. And the contractor here uh, is saying, well, the project manager certified 120,000 pounds initially. We don't like that, but that's the number that she came up with. Uh, the contractor saying we actually think it's 210,000 pounds, but the contractor saying that there's absolutely no way that anyone can say that the adjudicator should assess the compensation event at a number less than that that was originally certified by the project manager. The client has said, well, it's £25,000. Anyone can see that, I quote, and no calculation has been provided. Uh, those four words, anyone can see that, I kid you not, was in one of my adjudications a couple of years ago. Um, I, and uh, the argument here, I suspect, is whether anybody can see that. So I will now hand you over to Mr Gould to hear what the contractor has to say. Um, thank you, sir. So um, it, it's not just not open uh, for you to assess this compensation event at, at less than the project manager. Um, uh, and there are a variety of reasons for saying this. Um, just let me take you back to the notice. So the notice seeks an assessment of £210,000. That's um, the compensation event as calculated and assessed in detail by uh, the contractor. Um, it doesn't go on to say that you might assess some other sum. It simply says that that is the correct figure and that's the figure that you should assess. And if you look at the detail, you'll see it's carefully worked out. The project manager's assessment is, is, is not detailed at all. Um, but I, what I say is that um, from a logical perspective, it, that the boundaries really are 110 to 210, because under the contract, it is the contract that's to put forward a figure and they've done that with a calculation um, and then it is the project manager to attempt to assess it and that's what they have done and and some other figure plucked out of the air and, and guessed that is just not meaningful at all uh, and and so um, first then by looking at the notice we invite you to assess it at 210 um, uh, and no other figure because that's what the notice says but in any event um, it can't be less than 120,000 you don't have the power to do that, um, but in reality, you'd simply be plucking a figure out of the air, which is exactly what the client has done, and the contract does not anticipate you going down that route. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Gould. So we now hand over to, to Mr Glover. Um, thank, thank you, sir. Um, this issue raises a number of, of different issues. The first one is what the... Uh, contractor is actually asking for because as Mr Gould has said the notice seeks assessment of the compensation event at £210,000. Now in virtually every adjudication that I've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years um, the traditional wording is £210,000 or such other sum as the adjudicator might assess. Um, and the reason for this sir as you'll um, readily appreciate is that in omitting the words such other sum as the adjudicator might assess, your jurisdiction has been limited. You can either award the contractor £210,000 or nothing at all. Your flexibility um, has been taken away from you and that appears to be accepted um, by Mr Gould in his submissions. So that's the first issue. Um, 
The second issue is whether or not you can assess the compensation event at an amount less than claimed and an amount less than has been put forward by the project manager. Um, and the answer to that is yes, you can. Um, if you look at clause W2.34 of the contract, that allows the adjudicator yourself to review and revise the actions of the project manager. Um, and Mr Justice Fraser agreed and accepted this in the case of ICI v uh, Merit Merrill Technology um, for a couple of years ago, um, where he said that um, in his judgment, an adjudicator in, a, I think it was an NEC3, uh, NEC3 contract clearly has jurisdiction um, to review and revise any action of the project manager. This must include as a matter of language, the assessment of a compensation event. So you are able to assess the uh, compensation event at a value of less than £210,000. And the minute you find it worth um, £209,999, then the contractor is not entitled to anything because it's a different sum to that that's been sought in the adjudication notice. And I note that the contractor has made no effort whatsoever to explain or provide any de of the detail of the information. The contractor said, here it is. Well, as we know, the only reason the contractor is saying it's entitled to further money is reliance upon Brexit. Um, the, the contractor has said that it's a, a relying on the change of, of law clause. Well, that's misconceived. There hasn't been any change in law. We're still in the transition period. Brexit hasn't actually been done as yet. So that's no reason or justification for the an increase in the project manager's figure. So, so that deals with the first, you can't award any more than £120,000 because the reasons put forward by the contractor just don't wash. But secondly, if you look at the, um, um, the justification put forward by the contractor, well, anyone can see that it's worth nothing. And it's in fact, well, but we're being generous in saying that it's worth £25,000. And it may, you may have seen in an adjudication two years ago that someone said it. Well, sometimes the, the documents speak for themselves and that's all you can say. So we would say that the compensation event can only be assessed at £25,000. And in any event, it can, it's clearly less than £210,000, which leaves the contractor nothing because of the way it, it drafted its notice of adjudication. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with my commentator's hat on, for those of you who haven't read about ICI versus Merit Merrill, please do go away and read it. Uh, as one of the advocates just said, it was an NEC contract with an utter absence of mutual trust and cooperation. Uh, and I think the only people who made any money out of that job were the two legal professions. Uh, it's a fascinating read if you go away and pick up the uh, uh, the judgment. For those of you without access to sort of legal uh, databases, it's freely available on the Bailey website, bailey.org, Britain and Ireland Legal Information Institute. It is a cracking good read, and not just for contract law nerds like us. So what's my view? Um, clearly, W2.34 allows the adjudicator, and I quote, to review and revise any action or inaction of the project manager or supervisor related to the dispute and alter a matter which has been treated as accepted or correct. Um, and therefore, I, I think that I may assess the amount due here, whether it's higher or lower than the project manager's assessment or indeed exactly the same. The client has not provided any substantiation of its assessment of £25,000. Uh, I don't think the documents speak for themselves and the documents are silent on the quantum of this claim. The contractor, however, has provided a calculation in its referral supporting its assessment of £210,000. So I think overall, and moving now on to my decision as a whole, there is clearly a compensation event for the additional structures, the changes to the scope instructed by the project manager. The contractor provided a quote, a calculation for its assessment and the client has not. Uh, and there were earlier arguments about how the quantum should be assessed. And the contractor, I think is correct that the assessment should be based on defined cost, the short schedule of cost components, and that comes from clause 11.2.23 of option B. 
I don't think that an issue of law has arisen here. Um, on one hand, I agree with Mr Glover that there hasn't been a change in law on Brexit yet. We're in the transition period, um, but it doesn't matter. The short schedule of cost components requires the cost of plant and materials to be to be assessed on the defined cost rules. And if they now cost more from being imported from continental Europe, then that will be reflected in the costs that presumably Mr Gould's client can demonstrate to the client's satisfaction. So therefore, my assessment of this compensation event is that it should be £210,000 and that therefore a further £90,000 on top of the 120 that's already been paid should be paid within seven days of my decision. I now move on to the change to the completion date. So the referral, remember distinct from the notice, sought an additional four weeks change to the completion date. Uh, the client's response hasn't actually addressed the length of delay. All they've done is to argue that I don't have the jurisdiction to deal with it. Um, I've concluded that I do have the jurisdiction to deal with the completion date because it's a part of the delay damages argument. Uh, and given the absence of arguments from one party and a clear argument with an explanation from the other, I've agreed that the completion date should move back by four weeks. Therefore, the delay damages are not due for the four weeks that they have been uh, deducted and they should therefore be repaid to the contractor by the client within seven days. Now, somebody's just asked what's the difference between referral and notice and so on. Uh, just to fill you in on that, the notice of adjudication is the first document that starts the adjudication and it's the party referring this dispute, which here is the contractor, notifying the other party that it's starting an adjudication, it has a dispute, and these are the matters that we think form part of the dispute. It sets the jurisdiction for the adjudicator, and therefore, if after the notice has been served, additional or new items are brought into the dispute, there's potentially an argument that they did not form part of the dispute that was originally notified. And that uh, is why there is a difference between the two here, and that's why we're having this argument. So, the delay damages I'm saying give back and the referral also and the notice asked for interest uh, and interest is due here in accordance with clause 51.4 and the rate in the contract data that will be stated there and just as part of our attempt to get this down from 28 days to 90 minutes we've left the details of that mechanic uh, out of this this exercise. I'm not deciding on party costs. We discussed that earlier. I don't have the jurisdiction. And I've decided that uh, the parties will pay my fees in equal amounts. And it was interesting, a few minutes ago, Ross Hayes, who's one of the uh, NEC consultants, brought in the meeting chat uh, here that uh, <clears throat> the potential contradiction in the NEC documents, which I've highlighted here, in W2, it states that the adjudicator may allocate the adjudicator's fees, not the party's legal costs, but the costs of the adjudicator between the parties. Uh, I can say the contractor pays everything or the uh, client pays everything or they pay 50-50 or 75-25. But elsewhere, and some of you may have recognised this document, this is the dispute resolution service contract, which is what W2 requires you to use to appoint the adjudicator. It says in clause 211 that the parties are to pay me in equal shares unless otherwise agreed, which they certainly haven't here. Earlier in the DRSC, it says in the event of a conflict between the contract appointing the adjudicator and the construction contract, then it's the dispute resolution service contract that will prevail. Uh, but as Ross, Ross Hayes has said in the chat function on this presentation, uh, potentially the role of the Housing Grants Act will, will trump all of that. So in this decision, I'm saying it's 50-50 because um, of the clause in the dispute resolution service contract. Uh, adjudicators have the ability usually to allocate their fees based on on a number of 
certainly contractually unspecified items, sometimes adjudicators and indeed judges in court will look at the conduct of the parties. They've sent you 48 lever arch files of information and only asked you to refer to one of them and the other 47 haven't been opened. Is there, is there a cost of your time going through things that are irrelevant there? Um, I've just been asked in the chat, how often do you ever get appointed under the DRSC? The answer to that question is quite a lot. Uh, I do know a number of adjudicators that refuse to use it. For those of you who aren't linguistically up to date with NEC4, it's the document we used to call the adjudicators contract, but it is an express term of the adjudication provisions in NEC that you use that document. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Reflecting on this, and we do have 15 minutes for questions now. Uh, what about the rules for disputes? Do you think this process is too rule driven? For those of you who uh, spend your life running construction projects and getting things largely right, are you surprised at what you've seen about references to the rules, to jurisdiction? Think about the ability of either party to prove its case. It's long been said that the three important aspects for winning a claim or defending one successfully are records, records and records. If you put forward a demand for the adjudicator to think that something costs £25,000, you're expected to show that it does, just in the same way that if you want to claim a million pounds on someone, they're not expected to hand it over without you proving your claim. Um, what do you think about the reference back to the contract procedure and also the regular references to case law? The case law is absolutely vital and I think it was uh, Nicholas Gould said at the start, uh, we're I think 22 years into the world of uh, what we loosely call statutory adjudication, the case law is still evolving. Um, there was there was certainly an, an active flurry of it in the early years while we all got used to it, um, but that's still an important part of getting your dispute management right. Um, but clearly, uh, the answer to my final question, are disputes worth avoiding? Well, of course they are. Uh, but when you get into a dispute scenario, you might think that your side of the bargain's done everything right and the other lot are unreasonable. There does come a point where continually renegotiating things is just a waste of time. And I've just finished an NEC adjudication where two parties were arguing uh, about money that was allegedly due in 2016 and four years later they were still at it and one of them as you can imagine the party that thinks it's owed money brought the adjudication uh, and the other lot uh, settled after two weeks of adjudication for reasons best known to themselves uh, but disputes are definitely worth avoiding but they are of themselves necessary in the event that you you think your contractual rights have not been provided for so i think I'd just like to hand over firstly to, to Nicholas, if you've got any con concluding comments before we start answering questions. Yes, OK, and I'll keep it very short. Um, the reality is a lot of people don't actually look at their contracts or, or, or pay that much attention to them. And, and, and I started out life in the construction industry and, and what you do and did then and do now is you go and build it and you try your hardest to do a good job. It's only when um, you have issues and problems that you begin to start <laughs> to look in that contract. And of course, it's truer now than ever because contracts have become more complex. The, the Housing Grants Act introducing a, a payment notice driven system uh, means that we have disputes relating to all of that. So I'd encourage everyone to have a look at their contracts and see what's really in them. And and that point about rules and, and jurisdiction and so on, well, there's no point having an adjudication, spending lots of time and money on it and then not to have it enforced. Uh, and so it's quite important to, to have answers to these little questions that come along. And of course, if an adjudicator knows all these jurisdictional rule driven issues and problems, it means that they can crack on quickly with the dispute, even if the parties aren't fully aware of everything and get to the substance of the matter and make a decision about you know the real issues. And of course, if you look at most of the submissions we've all been making, we're trying to win on the process really or, or get the adjudicator uh, off the field as it were, when in reality, by the time we get near the end, it's all just about is the figure 210 and, 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 and should the delay damages be repaid. The quicker the parties can get to that, the better in any dispute. Thank you. OK, thank you, Nicholas. And Jeremy, have you any concluding comments? Uh, largely to echo what you what both you've said, Patrick, and what Nick has said. I mean, I think in many respects, the most important, the two most important bullet points on your reflection slides 
are, are disputes worth avoiding? Absolutely. Um, and it all, all comes down to the ability to prove the case. I mean, it's very easy once you get started under sort of and trying to resolve a dispute process, procedure, rules, case law becomes increasingly important. Um, I think so. And but what actually matters is whether or not you can prove the case that you're putting forward. And that it's all too easy to lose sight of that once you're caught up in a dispute. So, you know, and, and that was proven in this scenario here, whereas the, the you know, some of the things that the employer was saying, well, there was nothing to back it up. It literally was a piece of paper and that's never going to be good enough. And a properly advised party, whether they're contractor or client or whoever, should know if they've only got a piece of paper, then they should be doing their best to work out a way to try and avoid the dispute going to an adjudicator, let, let alone going to a court. OK, thank you. Well, we have a number of outstanding questions. Um, and there's one, it's not really a question, a statement's come in. For those of you who know uh, Professor Richard Patterson, the professor of NEC science at the University of Mott MacDonald, he's made the reinforcement of things that you'll have heard on his training courses if you've been, read the contract, talk a lot to each other, and do what it says in the contract. Now, that applies to NEC as it does to Patrick, FIDIC, Patrick. to JCT. Sorry, Patrick, talk and listen to each other, not talk a lot at each other, talk and listen to each other and then do what it says in the chuffing contract. Cheers. Chuff I, I, I missed off your adjective there deliberately at the end. Is Rich. chuffing a legal term? I think it's something to do with steam trains, isn't it? Right. Um, I'm just scrolling through the, the other questions. Um, it's some Andrew Ibbotson has said it seems time was not addressed in the original compensation event. Can you move the completion date? Well, yes, I concluded that I could move the completion date. Uh, Mr. Mr. Glover shaking his head in horror uh, at this decision. Um, the, the reality is that I couldn't have made the decision on delay damages without looking at the completion date. Uh, it's also a case that we looked at the inadequacies of the contract data that hadn't been drafted properly. Well, equally, I, I think here the notice hadn't been drafted properly. Uh, what most party representatives do is to write their referral first and then slim it down to turn it into the notice to make sure that the uh, redress sought in the notice does actually match that uh, that was in the um, it, that be subsequently becomes in the referral. Now, the in NEC land because money also attaches to time in compensation events. It's different from life in JCT land where extensions of time do not automatically lead to money. It does become an important issue, particularly as time and money are dealt with simultaneously. And a common error of contractors in NEC contracts is just to get the money sorted out in compensation events, intending to deal with the time later. And they often don't until it's too late and the project manager and or the client are not willing to deal with it. So uh, sometimes the time is not dealt with in, in CEs uh, because it's not been thought about and it absolutely needs to be if you're to get the relief you want and potentially the, the prolongation costs that you spend. Uh, I'm just looking at further questions. So Haley Drever has said in this example, each point was determined before moving on uh, to the next one and occasionally the result formed part of the subsequent arguments. Normally would all the decisions be given simultaneously at the end? Primarily, Haley, yes, they would. The arguments about jurisdiction tend to come in very early on from the responding party. And as I said at the time, they have to be dealt with at the time. In the event the jurisdiction challenge is correct and the adjudicator has no jurisdiction, the sooner he or she can resign and stop the process, the less money everyone will waste. There's not much point in taking a uh, an adjudication through to its ultimate conclusion and then on day 27 saying oh crikey I never had any jurisdiction we shouldn't have done any of that but generally speaking the other issues are all put in a written decision with reasons at the end and, and given to the parties on, on or before the final day. <laughs> 
Uh, Mohammed has said, is it not good to include senior management officials on both parties to discuss any conflict before escalation? Yes, 101%, absolutely right. That's the senior representatives process that's been built into NEC4 documents now. The two parties here chose to ignore it. Um, I've seen that process work very well in, in a number of contract situations in NEC, particularly in the UK government's private finance initiative contracts, they usually have uh, what I euphemistically term grown-ups provisions. So if the children aren't playing nicely, the grown-ups get brought in. And sometimes that process works with a bit more strategic vision and people who value relationships, but it doesn't always. Um, just looking at other questions here. Oh, somebody trying to be um, current. What if the dispute is the principle as to whether the employer should accept a COVID relief claim under PPN? Uh, PPN, for those of you who don't know, are notices issued by the, uh, the government, and I'm picking my words carefully, largely in England I'm talking about because the devolved administrations elsewhere do their own thing, as to potential contractual changes between public sector clients and uh, suppliers. Um, I'm going to dodge that one, James, um, other than to say that the PPNs on their on their own are merely uh, advisory notes issued by the government. And unless the parties actually agree changes to their contract, I don't think uh, they have any effect. I'd invite either of my legal friends to comment further on that. I, I agree. I, I think the um, you start with your contract, don't you? I know that, that COVID has been a, a worldwide problem and, and the government has issued this PPN and guidance and updates to it. Um, uh, so have a have a look at all of that. But in reality, it's not a straightforward area. So start with your contract and move on from there. One thing to say about COVID, um, it's happened, hasn't it? And there might be disruption, there might be delay and there might be cost problems age old story there is um, how in fact has your project been affected? It moves on quickly from the legal position to well, what really has happened? You know, have you got a right to time, maybe time only, no money, who knows? But can you show you've actually been affected? And we frequently see people that were saying at the moment, well, I've been affected for two months. Yes, but how? And it brings us all back to Patrick's early point of what are your records like? What records have you got? What have you done? Uh, and, and that's the most important message at the moment is to maintain good uh, communication about COVID problems and share records and, 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 and um, the ability to progress on site, labour, labour problems, materials problems and so on. So that if you can't settle, and that's your last bullet point, are disputes worth settling and avoiding? Absolutely. If you can't settle, at least there's some objective basis to put in front of adjudicators in the future. OK, thank you. Um, a, a very uh, good question from Ian Heafy about the contract that he helped draft. Um, hello, Ian. And he says, under option W1, and this is the dispute resolution option in NEC contracts where the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act does not apply, would the adjudicator take any notice of one party's refusal to use the senior representative process in either the decision or a costs decision? Um, the honest answer to that a question, Ian, is I'm not sure. From my memory of W1, which I've never actually used in NEC4, the uh, senior representatives get the issues referred to them. And is it a case it's only the things that they can't deal with that get sent to the adjudicator? I'm just scrabbling around looking at my document here um, to see if that's the case. Uh, Patrick, sorry, there was a typo on my part there. It was actually W2. I meant to say rather than W1. Oh, so thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for that, Ian. I can I can now pretend I know what I'm talking about. Um, the I don't think so because, and I'll I'll invite Jeremy and Nicholas to come in after me um, as lawyers. They may have a, a better understanding. But under the the Housing Grants Act, you have the right to take something to adjudication at any time. That's written into W2. So presumably nothing can be put in the contract um, to, to, to prevent you or to discourage you from doing that. So uh, uh, Jeremy's disappeared, but Nicholas- No, I no I'm you. still here. I'm oh, still right. Here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I agree with you entirely. I mean, you, you, that you, you can't be discouraged or prevented from adjudicating, um, but you may find that one of the parties might try and persuade 
the adjudicator that when they, he's considering apportioning his own costs, he might like he or she might like to take into account the actions or inactions in this instance of the party who've declined to use the senior management option. And you may find that um, some adjudicators might be persuaded, particularly if by way of comparison, you, you look at the attitude of courts to costs where parties decline to use any form of ADR um, during court proceedings. So I can see that some adjudicators might well be persuaded to um, that that will have an impact on their costs award. OK, thank you. Well, we have reached two o'clock, um, which means we uh, we have to stop now. So uh, thank you to all of you who attended today. Uh, and I hope you got some something out of this. Uh, thank you to Jeremy and to Nicholas at Fenwick Elliott for their contribution to this. Um, Nicholas and I first started talking about this several months ago before anyone could even spell COVID, let alone worry about doing this uh, online. With, this was semi-prepared for uh, a meeting room presentation at One Great George Street. Um, it certainly uh, surprised uh, me with how much uh, we ended up getting done today. Uh, somebody in one of the questions said, what will you do if they don't call you sir? Well, in a, in a mock exchange of emails earlier this week, Mr Glover, when he found out he'd largely lost this adjudication, sent me some very rude words and said he wasn't going to pay me, he wasn't going to pay the contractor and you can all get lost, basically. Uh, people rarely put that in writing. That was all quite lighthearted, but that's usually what they're thinking and what they're saying at the time. Uh, if somebody doesn't call me, sir, it doesn't bother me in the slightest is the answer to that question. Uh, this is a, a business process. We've all got to approach it in a business-like manner. Uh, and behave in adjudication as we would in any other aspect of, of our business lives. Uh, thank you also to the NEC team. There's quite a few people on this call uh, listening in who've been involved in organising it and arranging it. Um, so it just remains for me to thank everybody and, and wish you all uh, the very best of the remainder of Tuesday. Thank you. And Patrick, many thanks to you also for, for today and organising this. It's been, uh, been good fun. I hope everybody out there enjoyed it also. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.